Global. We in Incredible India believe in Matru Devo Baba, Pitru Devo Baba, Acharya Devo Baba, and Atiti Devo Baba. There are many teachers here for them, greetings. There are many participants, they are Atidis, so for them, the greetings. A very warm welcome to everyone, mainly iconic figure, Dr. Narayana sir, and the guest speakers, uh, Dr. Nagavi sir, Dr. Ramanamurthy sir, Dr. Ramesh Jagadisan sir, Dr. Sriram sir, and Dr. Jill sir. And all the participants, I, I very, very, very warm welcome to all of you. Guide School of Pharmacy, IKSC Guide School of Pharmacy, in association with the Indian Pharmaceutical Association, uh, Rajamadri branch is uh, starting a faculty development yeah. program today. It will be running from today to uh, June 5th. Welcome all of you for this warm uh, uh, meeting. We'll have a good sessions here. So uh, now let us see what uh, about our college, our management and uh, uh, infrastructure of our college. So here is an AV of this. Faculty Development Program on Skill Development in Pharmacy Education and Research and Practice is organized by Guide School of Pharmacy IQAC, which is accredited by NAC and in association with the Indian Pharmaceutical Association Rajmandri branch. And the organizing members are Dr. S. Ramachandra, Vice Principal, Dr. V. T. Sundar, Professor and Head, Dr. R. Vijayalakshmi, IQAC Coordinator. The convener is uh, Dr. M. D. Dhanaraj. Uh, we'll see the vision and mission quality policy of the institute to evolve and emerge into a premier and most preferred educational institution at every level of academic pursuit across the country is our mission and a mission vision now mission is to foster human excellence imbued with integrity loyalty and the spirit of service to mankind through education of global standards steeped in indian ethos and values the quality policy of our institute is to produce quality pharmacists who are resourceful and innovative in approach, who are ready to shoulder challenging assignments in industry, academics, and research. Our chief patrons of our institute are uh, PKVV Satyanarana Rajagaru, founder of Guide Institutions, PKVV Sasikiran Varmagaru, vice chairman, Guide Institutions. Mrs. K. V. Lakshmi Rajugaru, Executive Director, Guide Institutions. Our dedicated team, the ship of this, uh, the captain of this uh, ship is Dr. M. D. Dhanarajugaru, Principal and also a Research Director of our Institute. And the organizing teams are Dr. S. Ramachandran, Dr. V. D. Sundar, and Dr. R. Vijay Lakshmi. The program objectives uh, it will make the participants to understand the skills required to foster the needs of industry upgrade on innovation and quality for research, learn the art of writing thesis or proposals to various funding agencies, help the teacher to understand problem-based learning. These are the major objectives of our program, this FD faculty development program. And the schedule is from uh, June 1st to June 5th. There are five speakers. Dr. B.G. Nagavi, sir, is going to speak on skill development and research in higher education practice. Outlines of this topic is uh, it is about critical thinking, problems, and dissemination, and also career skills. Doctor is going to speak on second June. Good research practices and thesis writing. This, the outlines of this is uh, there will be a writing thesis statement, how to write thesis statement, how to plan, how to design research and how to write the bibliography. These are the main outlines of this topic. Now on third, Dr. Ramesh Jagadeesan sir will be talking on innovations during quality pharmacy education research and practice. The outlines of this topic are innovation in development, quality and regulatory, skill requirements at various levels. 
and on 4th June, Dr. S. Sriram sir will be talking on principles of problem based learning in pharmacy education. And in this topic, he is going to discuss about fact finding, idea finding, solution findings, and learning issues. Dr. Gil sir, on 5th June, he will be talking on the art of writing good research proposal. In this topic, he is going to discuss about the research objectives, scope, and limitations, its significance, and funding agencies. Special speaker is Dr. T. V. Narayana sir. He is an iconic figure in the field of pharmacy profession. Or Dr. V. G. Nagavi sir. Uh, he is a senior consultant, Higher Education Skill Development and Research Center, Mysore. And Dr. K. V. Ramanamuthi sir, principal, AU College of Pharmaceutical Sciences. Dr. Ramesh Jagadishan, sir, Senior Director, Analytical Development Receive Farm, Bengaluru. Dr. S. Sriram, sir, Senior Professor, Sri Ramakrishna Institute of Paramedical Sciences, Coimbatore. Dr. De Jill, sir, the Lead Analyst, Bioinformatics from Indigene. These are the main speakers of today. Uh, may I ask our principal, sir, to address the participants? Before that, I'll introduce our principal, sir. Dr. M. V. Dhanaraju, sir, he is also a research director at School of Pharmacy. He is having academic and teaching experience of 24 years. He has guided 10 PhDs and 70 and also 34 UG students. He has published research publications around 195 and uh, he has published in research papers in scientific sessions that is around 36. Uh, he has book chapters or books published in the number of books published are around and yes, he has received a grant of rupees uh, from RPS, uh, ACT, New Delhi, and he has, patent, he has filed a patent of one and is a central council member of IPA Mumbai, vice president IPA Rajamandri branch, Andhra Pradesh, and is a member of scientific services committee, IPCA in 2018, LOC coordinator, Visakhapatnam for IPC, joint secretary, joint secretary, for Apticon 2013, Rajmandri. He was the convener of Andhra University Youth Festival in 2010, executive committee member of APTI India of AP State Branch since 2009, peer reviewer of scientific journals for 28, including Nature Group Journal. He has presented papers in various conferences of FIP, ACCP, and many others held at various countries. May I now ask our principal, sir, to address the participants, please, sir. A warm good morning to all. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome you all on online platform faculty development program on skill development in pharmacy education, research, and practice. I take this opportunity to welcome the speakers and faculty from all over the India. We saw good response from the faculty across the state to listen the topics of that will be delivered by the eminent speakers for next five days. A special presence of our beloved, my friend and mentor, IPA President, Dr. TV Narayana sir, and guest speaker, Dr. Naga is a, is a senior consultant, is a higher education, skill development and research center, Mysuru. The second speaker, Professor K.V. Ramamurthy sir, principal, College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, Andhra University, Visakhapatna, and Dr. Ramesh Degadishan, Senior Director, Antigen Department, Recipom, Bangalore, and Dr. S. Siram, Senior Professor, Sri Ramakrishna Institute of Paramedical Sciences, Paimutu, Dr. D. Jalan, Lead Analyst, Indigen, Bangalore. I heartily welcome all the speakers, sir. Uh, at the outset, I would like to introduce our institution, Guide School of Pharmacy was established in the year 2004 by Chaitanya Group under eminent leadership of our founder chairman, C. K. V. V. Satyanarayana Raju. He is one of the first institutions in East Godavari district. And within the span of four years, in 2008, we have been at the uh, B-Form, M-Form form, the author of the has been recognized in the first institution in India in 2008. And it has been accredited by National Board of Accreditation, 
even you can see the bunch of past what also it will be expired it will have 20 or 50 pages is a 100 pages of passport and uh, the third or fourth passport so such a uh, iconic figure he has organized four international conventions 21 national workshops and 10 student congress and more than 100 seminars in various places throughout the country he has participated in more than 100 conferences as a research person and chaired more than 50 scientific sessions at national level and 12 sessions at international level so we can say the few uh, about our award received he has been received prestigious ipa eminent pharmacist of the year 2016 and ipa fellowship in 2005 fellowship of association of biotechnology and pharmacy in 2008 and paul harris fellowship and sri mua award in 2010 and Shikshak Bhushan Award in 2009, Best Alumni of EAU 2006. So these are the few about our TV Naran sir. Even if you have more and more, but there is no time. A, I put it in a nutshell and given a brief introduction about Dr. TV Naran sir. Thank you very much, sir, for coming. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for coming and uh, participating here. Thank you very much. Uh, now, uh, uh, you can take up the session. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Am I audible? Yeah, yeah. Yes, it's yes, clear, sir. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Dandraj, uh, for the nice introduction. And uh, it is my privilege to associate uh, for today's uh, faculty development program. And first of all, my compliments and congratulations to Guide School of Pharmacy, particularly the uh, IQAC cell, that is a uh, uh, cell with in association with the uh, Indian Pharmaceutical Association Rajimandri local branch for uh, taking initiation and organizing a five days workshop on faculty development program on skill development in pharmacy, education, research, and practice. And uh, I, in addition to my compliments and congratulations to the organizers, I personally thank. Dr. Nagavi, a senior most teacher in the profession of pharmacy, and also Professor K.B. Ravanamurthy, who is my senior and principal of the Andhra University College of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and uh, Dr. Sriram, again, he is our uh, associate secretary of the Indian Pharmaceutical Association at national level, and Dr. Ramesh and Dr. Gillis, uh, who have come forward and given their consent to share their expertise with the faculty. In this regard, uh, I remember my interaction with Dr. Nagavi recently. I know him since 1990, uh, when he, is the, he was the principal of JSS College of Pharmacy, one of the premier institute in India. From there, he has gone to Rack University in uh, Saudi. And where uh, we had an interaction that is in the year 2013 or 14. There I have seen the developments. He has uh, taken the charge of developing the university, a premier uh, university in that particular area. And I have seen so many changes he brought and uh, so many areas he brought and training the student. And uh, three months back, in fact, before the COVID-19, uh, I had a interaction with Dr. Nagavi and we were uh, discussing to train the teachers, particularly in the area of pharmacy, young teachers, because we both are under the impression the present teachers who are joining the pharmacy profession, not having any opportunity to learn what are the teaching methods, what are the teaching techniques and all, because just after completion of their post-graduation, they will come and join as a lecturer. And uh, some sort of uh, lacunas we observed from, from the present generation teachers. And uh, Nagavi has come forward and he has come out with uh, that particularly the Hesdar Center. Uh, through the center, he is uh, training so many teachers and we organized some three programs in colleges where he trained the teachers and I have seen the uh, motivation and uh, the zeal to train the teachers, particularly by a senior professor like Dr. Nagavi. I personally thank Dr. Nagavi for coming forward and uh, accepting 
to train our the next generation teachers, particularly in pharmacy. And moreover, I'm very happy the Dr. Dhanraj has contacted Dr. Nagavi and he has consented to give the training to the faculty of the present generation. And uh, I'm very happy the his experience and uh, his expertise at both, not only at national level, at international level also definitely going to help the present faculty. That's what uh, I am looking forward. And also Dr. Ravanamurthy, who is my senior in Andhra University and also uh, I proudly say I have seen recently the Andhra University, the first university to come out with the online submission of the session marks and all the online teaching methodology. When the EGC is not yet given the guidelines, he has come out with the guidelines and he has given and uh, he is coming out with the latest development. And I am also happy this COVID-19 either by force or by compulsion made all our teachers to equip themselves with the latest technology. Otherwise, we have not equipped ourselves with the latest developments on par with the international standards. But now I'm very happy. I appreciate our teachers who are equipped and equipping themselves and uh, they are giving their best trials to cope up with the latest technology using the latest technology. And uh, that is the result of this online webinars and development programs and all these things. I'm very happy. And uh, IPA has uh, given the introduction by the Dhanraj. Uh, he is doing wonderful activities in this COVID-19, including the release of the e-bulletin, online bulletin with the uh, interviews of the experts. And IPA Students Forum particularly is organizing webinars with the experts. And uh, shortly, IPA is coming with IPA online placement conclave. All the rounds of the placements will be conducted online, and the final interview will be conducted by the respective companies. These are the some of the initiatives taken by the Indian Pharmaceutical Association. I feel proud to uh, lead the organization in forefront, and that is the Indian Pharmaceutical Association. And perhaps uh, Dr. Nagavi is also Vice President of Indian Pharmaceutical Association. We had a long association with Indian Pharmaceutical Association. And uh, these are some of the excellent activi activities organized by Indian Pharmaceutical Association. And this pharmacy education research practice, that was the present uh, uh, faculty development program taken, given the five days uh, task to all the experts. This education, research, and practice where we stand because these are the three corners of the triangle, but the center focus is the patient and how we are going to excel in this area. What are the uh, lacunas? All the three areas we have the lacunas, even education, research, practice. And education, we know up to 2014, there is a dichotomy of pharmacy education in our country. Now only we have come out with the single regulating body by Pharmacy Council of India. And the PCI is also taking so many initiatives to streamline the education in the country. And they are planning to come out with the need-based curriculum both in undergraduate and postgraduate and so many developments are taking place. And the research, you know, till today, the exact research is not there in our country. And uh, the investment and research is not even percent and compared with the developing countries and we have to establish ourselves equip ourselves to concentrate on research and train the students in the areas of research also and uh, i'm very happy the present uh, researchers uh, for the covid 19 vaccine indian three companies are in forefront uh, that is the strength of our indian farm industry but we have to train our students to equip ourselves to meet the challenges in the area of research. Practice, just we started uh, in the year 2008 with the PharmD program. Otherwise, till that time, they, we don't have any expertise in the area of practice. Again, I remember Dr. Nagavi, his contribution for uh, coming out with the B Pharma practice curriculum those days in the year 2006 or something like that. He has come out. But that time nobody accepted that. But now 
we are all looking at the syllabus uh, expertise what he has prepared those days and we have come out with the pharmacy practice program and this is the new area uh, coming out in our india it takes another uh, i think uh, five or six years to cope up ourselves and par with the international arena this is the pharmacy practice area so i am very happy the teachers uh, faculty development program uh, the guide school of pharmacy and the organizers they have rightly chosen the development skill development in pharmacy education research and practice definitely this is the need of the hour and uh, our uh, latest young farm teachers are going to be benefited with the experience and expertise of all these uh, persons once again i thank the uh, resource persons dr nagavi dr ramamurthy and ramesh and dr sriram and dr gilles for uh, uh, accepting and coming forward to train our teachers and also my congratulations and compliments to guide school of pharmacy and uh, ipr rajmandri local branch particularly my friend dr dhanraj and dr ramchandra dr sundar and dr vijayalakshmi for uh, taking initiations and organizing such a wonderful activity i wish all these uh, this five days program is going to be fruitful and uh, i wish entire the faculty are going to be benefited with the expertise of these experts so with this few words of introduction and my opening remarks i hand over the session to the organizers and i wish all this five days program going to be fruitful thank you very much for giving me the opportunity over to tanraj and vijay lakshmi uh, thank you very much sir for your uh, introduction and thank you for your uh, introduction speech to our faculty members so those who are uh, joined in this group so there are 1168 uh, registration we can make only 1000 people only can be accommodate in our uh, this platform so thank you thank you very much sir organizers thank you sir for the concept to train the next generation teachers and taking initiatives to educate students through ipasf and thank you sir very much for your valuable remarks now i request now i request dr s ramachandran sir vice principal guide school of pharmacy to introduce our guest speaker dr b g nagavi sir the session is over to you dr s ramachandran sir good morning uh, dignitaries uh, online dignitaries tv narayana garu dr b g nagavi i am privileged to introduce today's speaker dr b g nagavi dr nagavi is founder ceo and senior consultant of higher education skill development and research hsdar hsdar center mysuru and dr nagavi was working as a professor and founding dean rack college of pharmaceutical sciences rack medical and health sciences university rack uae dr nagavi established pharmacy practice in the year 1930 1993 to 94 in mysuru and developed clinical pharmacy program he established jss community pharmacy in mysuru and developed community pharmacy program Dr. Nagavi guided 40 PG projects and 5 PhD projects and he is a member of board of directors of Asian Association of Schools of Pharmacy and he was also ex-com member of academic section of International Pharmaceutical Federation FIP and Dr. Nagavi is a former principal of JSS College of Pharmacy Mysuru from 1985 to 2007 for a period of 22 years and he is a vice president of he was a vice president of indian pharmaceutical association ipa from 2000 to 2006 and he has got 70 national and 13 international publications for his credit and he has he had addressed around 25 international and more than 160 national level conferences and meetings and traveled around the globe and he is a recipient of distinguished teacher award of aptii in 1998 
Dr. Nagavi has a patent and trademark registration to his credit. And Dr. Nagavi is a fellow of IPA, an Indian Society of Ethnopharmacology. He is an honorary member of Saudi Pharmaceutical Society and he had established a comprehensive clinical pharmacy program in JSS Hospital through PG Education and Practice in collaboration with RGH Adelaide and University of South Australia. Now I request our speaker of the day, Dr. B.G. Nagavi, sir, to take over the session. Nagavi, sir, you are most welcome. We are very privileged to have Dr. B.G. Nagavi, sir, for joining us today in today's session. Thank you, sir. May I now request Dr. B.G. Nagavi, sir, to present his valuable insights to train the faculty. Please, sir, now the session is over to you. Yes, sir. This is TV Narayana. Just I want to share uh, one minute. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. You are clear, sir. You are audible. Yeah, uh, see, Dr. Nagavi, <laughs> after good, putting up, uh, more than 30 years of experience in uh, teaching in India, yes, sir. and uh, I have seen him in the ranking most in Saudi Arabia. There, I came to know so many things, how the, he has implemented so many new areas on par with international uh, standards. But then, I came to know what is PBL, what is EBL. I was not knowing as a teacher, having 20 years of experience in India. That time only, he brings teachers problem-based learning, evidence-based learning, how you are going to train the students. These are some of the excellent areas he has developed there. And after he has come back from Abu Dhabi, uh, Saudi Arabia to uh, India, uh, from UAE, he has started this Hesdar Center and started giving training to our teachers. One of the main observation, <laughs> what we both coincide, coincide in uh, one area is our teachers are ready to give their uh, teaching technology, everything. But we are not trained up to the international level. We were not knowing what is happening at the international level. And we have limitations. Being a teacher, even though we want to know the latest developments taking place and all, but we have our limitations, maybe because of the constraints for the management. And, but uh, he has come forward and started giving training to young teachers where I was associated with him, uh, moved to three colleges and trained the entire staff, the excellent way of training. I request all the young teachers who are in the pharmacy profession, make use of his expertise, be in touch with him, develop yourself and develop your core competency in teaching particularly. I want to advise the present generation teachers to take the advantage of this program. So make use of the expertise of the Dr. Nagavi and he is ready to share his expertise. He is ready to train the young teachers. He is such a, uh, we, are, we are lucky to have such a great teacher and a hardcore teacher in this present generation, for the present generation teachers. I request all the young generation teachers to make use of this uh, expertise. Be in touch with him, develop your core competency, and be on par with any international teacher. That's what I want to advise. And again, my compliments to Guide School of Pharmacy and IQSSL and IPA for introducing such a great teacher to the present generation teachers. So I wish uh, the generation is going to be benefited with this faculty development program. And uh, uh, again, uh, my special thanks to Dr. Nagavi for sparing his valuable time and coming forward and want to share his expertise with our present generation. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Sir, your introduction about Dr. Nagavi, sir, for our generation, it is very, uh, very uh, in impressive. So I feel that I'm, I'm very eager to listen to his lecture. It is our privilege to have Dr. B.G. Nagavi, sir, for joining us in today's session. Thank you, sir. May I now request Dr. B.G. Nagavi, sir, to present his valuable insights train the faculty. Please, sir, now the session is over to you. Uh, hello.
I would like to thank the teachers. COVID-19 lockdown has not stopped the teachers from teaching and nation building activities. I congratulate each one of you for having taken um, uh, teaching as your career and as your profession and as your passion. There is a saying, one effective teacher is more than 1000 pandits or priests or maulvis because you are working with the youngsters um, who have a long future working period of 30 to 40 years ahead and we are grooming them as new nation builders so teachers role is um, uh, you know very very important in the um, country and as well as the globe the the, the presentation objective is, you know, I will try to, uh, Hesdar Center, which started in 2017, will try to inform you some things, motivate you, it will try to inspire you, and it will transform you. That's my objective uh, in the today's uh, presentation for about uh, 50 minutes or so I have been given from now. Yeah, these are the broad learning outcomes I have listed uh, for myself that I will try to list. I'm going to focus only about education, about teacher training, how important it is, and what we need to do to empower and encourage our teachers to, uh, you know, to come up to the expectations of the 21st century learners and the need. I'll try to identify a few skill gaps in higher education, especially in education tools and techniques, curriculum design and assessment. I will try to identify specific skill gaps in the faculty and suggest how these gaps can be filled by upskilling and reskilling our faculty. I'll try to explain the advantages of skill development, which is very obvious. I will also define education research and list few areas very broadly, what we can do in education research, um, which I think is a new area. I will share that and uh, list few topics. I will share, um, recently we published uh, just last week in May 2020 uh, in the latest issue of Indian General Pharmaceutical Education and Research, a, a research project on education itself. I will share that and, um, and I will broadly describe the focus, the activities of HESDAR Center for your interest and uh, encouragement and, and the future interaction. These are the skill gaps in our uh, undergraduate students when they come out. So that I am going to link it with the faculty skill gaps. As uh, Narayana was mentioning, we are um, a very weak compared to internationally in terms of education, in, in terms of research, as well as practice. So therefore, our UG uh, graduates, undergraduates, when they come out, they are not able to do what the market or the industry wants them to do because those skills have not been given in the college. And there is an urgent need to identify a set of skills for each course, which is taught at the BFARM level, and see that there are no overlaps, and, uh, and the students should progress and learn these skills systematically from year one to year four, so that when they go out to the, uh, to the world of work, uh, they should be able to do an excellent job. That is the main objective. And these skills are changing with the changing times, especially the COVID has brought new challenges to us, and we have to meet these challenges um, and train our uh, uh, students um, and uh, future practitioners in that. And uh, there is a practice school concept in the undergraduate uh, curriculum given by the Pharmacy Council of India, and I think it is in semester seven or eight, whatever it is, that needs to be strengthened to a great extent in order to take the students closer to the world of work while they are studying. Our uh, graduate finally also find it very hard to compete internationally, and uh, now their mobility has increased. People are learning and going all over the world. We have to make them comp uh, uh, so that they can compete internationally. <laughs> if you come to the skill gaps quickly, I would like to uh, see that we have a uh, we have no uh, much innovation done in our curriculum designing, delivery, and our assessments are very usual assessment techniques we are using. We need to change them because the world has changed but we have not changed in India. We need to change the assessment, especially the COVID is forcing us to change the design, delivery, as well as the assessment of the curriculum. We, to do this, we need to do proper surveys and feedbacks and research in higher education. We cannot just uh, leave it to somebody or uh, some institution to suggest this and do it. No, we have to have a much um, a larger picture of this. Evidences have to be collected. Some facts have to be collected. So do we, we, we do a proper change. So therefore, we need to do research in education. We need to 
right knowledge, skill and attitude for each and every course that we roll out uh, in the uh, country in various colleges and universities. And the number is, uh, as you know, the, there are about 2000 colleges in the country and uh, the, the task is very, very formidable. There is a lot of um, uh, gap in our uh, assessment uh, methodology, whether it is a formative assessment and uh, or a summative assessment. We are using the word assessment tools of uh, rote uh, memory checking, which are not very valid today, especially in the uh, even before COVID days and uh, um, during and after COVID days. We need to bring in new uh, assessment tools where we check the students' analytical thinking, problem solving, formulative thinking like that. We need to change the attitude of the students to be improved with the new you know tools of uh, software uh, soft skill development like critical thinking formulative thinking collaborative way of working self-managing time managing and things like that so there is a uh, uh, there, there is no continuous and need-based improvement and upgradation of the curriculum of several programs as we see in india so there is a need to look at this and our is development therefore has to be taken in a very big scale at the national level especially focusing on uh, young and energetic faculty who have joined and uh, who are new less than two years three years five years of experience and whenever i have gone to various institutions i have seen you know the uh, young band of faculties are more and the average age of the faculty i have seen is only around uh, 32 to 34 years so if we train this um, a large bunch of uh, faculty with new tools and techniques of teaching and uh, learning and delivery curriculum and assessments, they will become a very good and uh, um, uh, excellent teachers who will deliver quite a lot and uh, motivate the students to learn better. Internationally, research is conducted in higher education in the design, need-based curriculum, in courses, credits, content, delivery, assessment tools and techniques, etc. But however, in the Indian scenario, we do not see the, 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 the research being done in this area. That's why I want to sensitize you to think in this new way, which I have worked in um, American-based universities um, in, the United, in the United Arab Emirates for about 11 years I, as the founding dean, and I have seen a lot of new things happening there. I thought I should sensitize you people here. To achieve all this, our faculty needs to be reskilled, upskilled, informed, motivated, and inspired. Faculties have to be not just encouraged. You would say we are encouraging, we are encouraging. One is encouragement, next one is empowering them, giving them the facilities, giving them all the necessary um, infrastructure support so that they can really deliver the goods. In fact, pharmacy education in India is going to celebrate its centenary sometime in 2028. That means we are 100 year um, old organization. So therefore, I think we need to, to deregulate the education system. We need to give more autonomy to performing colleges with their periodic review, mentoring and monitoring system. Especially, well, we have a large number of uh, deemed to be universities and autonomous colleges. They should be empowered more to design and offer and assess courses, train the students as done in few universities in the country, including in Bits Pilani, one of the top private universities in India and in other international universities. I'm happy to uh, share that uh, I'm a proud alumni of Bits Pilani, where I was studying from 1977 to 85 for my master's and PhD. I was also a lecturer there in the initial years from 80 to 84 before I came to Mysore in 1985. So the presentation objective is to uh, inform you certain new things, which I am thinking for the last uh, several years, uh, with my 40 years of uh, experience, or totally 50 years of engagement with pharmacy, uh, when I joined my first um, um, B Farm College in 1972, in Government College of Pharmacy in Bangalore. So with that experience, I thought I should share my uh, knowledge and experience. Please remember that the good teachers are not just readily available anywhere. If you see the UGC reports, there is a shortage of teachers around 15 to 20 percent or more as per UGC reports in colleges and universities today in India. And there is an acute shortage of good teachers and a very, very acute shortage of inspiring and role model teachers. Then what do we do? What we have to do is train properly the available and especially the young teachers. They are the ones who are going to change the future. 
So we must concentrate on young teachers and train them in a big way and invest very heavily and empower potential and competent teachers. There are plenty of them, hundreds of them in the country. We need to identify them, not only encourage them, but empower them and give them all the necessary support and invest on them heavily so that they bring about a subtle change in the education system which we need. You know, teachers are not just readily available. Uh, uh, as I said, we have to invest um, uh, on role model teachers and bring them to the forefront, put them in the forefront, ask them to uh, play around and be a model to others and bring in changes collaboratively. Make the available faculty more knowledgeable, more skillful and more competent with the excellent soft and communication skills. Whenever I have gone to various institutions in the last three years, I have gone to more than 30, 32 uh, colleges and universities i need the, i found that there is a need to refocus and improve their domain specific knowledge domain specific skill and soft skills and communication skills on the one side and we need to empower them more and encourage them more about education education and technology delivery of the course and things like that i would like to show you this uh, small video please have a look a young man went over to another jew at a wedding he said, you remember me? He said, I don't remember you. Who are you? He introduces himself. He says, ah, you were my student. Third grade, you were my student. Yeah. Wow, I haven't seen you in so many years. How is your life? What are you involved in? He says, I'm a teacher. He says, wow, just like me. What inspired you to become a teacher? What inspired me to become a teacher was you. He said, how did I inspire you to become a teacher? I saw what an impact you had on me. I realized what an impact I can have on children. I decided to go into education. I said, what type of impact did I have on you? She said, I'll remind you, but I'm sure you remember the story. There was one day that one of my friends got himself, his mother or father bought him a beautiful wristwatch and I dreamt for a watch and I didn't afford one. So I decided to steal his watch. He had it in his pocket. I took his watch, I stole it. He came into class, he said, somebody stole his watch. He came complaining to the teacher, somebody stole his watch. So you made an announcement. Whoever took this boy's watch, please return it. I was too embarrassed and I didn't want to return it. So I didn't return it. So you locked the door. You said, I'm going to have to line everybody up and empty their pockets in order to get back the watch. And that put it. And I thought to myself, this is going to be the most shameful moment of my life. And then you said, all boys line up at the wall, but I want everybody to have their eyes closed. Everybody's eyes must be closed. And you went from pocket to pocket. Everybody's eyes were closed. And then you came to my pocket and you found the watch. And you took it out and you went through everybody's pockets with everybody's eyes closed. And then you said, okay, everybody can open their eyes. You gave the watch back to its owner. You never ever said a word to me throughout the entire year. You never mentioned the story. You never mentioned the episode. When I thought to myself how you saved my dignity that day, instead of being stereotyped as a ganev, as a thief, as a chakran, as a lawyer, as a no good nick, as a despicable child, you really saved my soul. You saved my dignity. And you never mentioned a word, not only to anybody else, not only to the owner, but even to me. It was, it happened, it's over. I understood the message. And when I looked at that, I saw it. I said, wow, this is what a teacher is. This is what a real educator is. This is what I want to do with my life. And therefore I went into education. The teacher is listening to him and he says, wow, that's amazing. That's really amazing. But he says, but Rebbe, you don't remember, you don't remember the story. Like when you see me and you hear my name, I'm sure you remember the story that I stole the watch and what you did that you didn't want to embarrass me, seeing everybody's eyes closed. And I'm the person, he says, actually, I don't know. I, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't know the story. He says, why, why not? Like, it's a pretty dramatic story. He says, because I also closed my eyes. So I want to bless you and bless all of us. We should be able to uh, be such, such leaders, such teachers, such parents, such educators, such mashpiyim, to be able to be there for people in this way. Good.
i hope you enjoyed the video the message in the video is that great teachers are not just made in the classroom great teachers have to understand the students and the human psychology better than the parents then they can deal with them better you can be a great teacher if you want nobody can stop you doesn't cost to be a great teacher just your efforts you can then inspire and transform your students to be like you see this teacher whom you saw in the video you saw one student um, it happens in the even in the college somebody stole a watch but he found out who took the watch and gave it back to the owner and without realizing eyes closed so he didn't know who even took the uh, who stole the um, watch so and he did not mention the name of the student who took the watch he maintained his respect and dignity so we have to understand the sensitivity sensitivities and raise it up to the level now what i have done is i have tried to identify you five gaps in our faculty um, uh, skills and i have tried to find some solutions to that because i just don't want to um, identify gaps and this is the problem that is the problem i am giving you uh, solutions also there is no formal training in education pedagogy and learner needs to our new teachers you know if you want to teach in a primary school you need a nst if you want to teach in a high school you need a d uh, ed or a b ed then you need m ed Uh, you need phd in education but unfortunately in higher education in health, health science or technical education you need to have a highest degree and you don't have to have any training in formally in education and education technology so the solution to this is we have to invest and train in a focused manner on our young faculty on a very big scale with assessment and certification tools to make sure they are they are trained they are skilled properly our teachers are not familiar with the modern education tools and techniques like problem based learning team based learning case based learning program and uh, course learning outcomes what are these and how to write for their own courses people are not very familiar so we have to train our new faculties on this new teaching and um, uh, learning and uh, tools and the techniques that are available in the public domain and the, this problem based learning in fact was uh, Uh, implemented way back in uh, uh, early 60s or late uh, 50s um, in the McMaster University in Canada even after 50 years 60 years we have not caught up with this new uh, teaching learning techniques because we are not innovating and we are not changing our very rigid and uh, uh, age old systems of uh, routine teaching and learning so we can change here also soft skills and attitude needs upskilling and reskilling our people do have um, a good amount of soft skill because of the cultural background they come upbringing and all that but that's not enough with the changing time we need our teachers to work on new soft skills maybe time management skill maybe you know collaborative skill interpersonal skills stress management skills etc etc which they have not been exposed to formally in the higher education system all are not comfortable with the digital tools techniques and online teaching and learner engagement as i see in the colleges many teachers are comfortable but do, do not have the facilities those who have the facilities there is some problem or the other we need to address this holistically in the colleges even outside everybody should be empowered and trained to use digital tools and techniques in a very big way uh, communication skills are not adequate with not with every faculty definitely with few faculty and uh, new faculty should be trained in uh, good verbal non verbal and communication skills even written communication skills these are quickly i identified four five gaps and four five ways other than this of course they need training in uh, domain specific uh, knowledge skill uh, that they may be in pharmaceutics or pharmaceutical chemistry uh, uh, pharmacology clinical pharmacy latest uh, trends in these areas obviously the faculties have to be aware so what we need to do is we'll we'll handle education technology related issues uh, yeah advantages of skill development i have tried to list here that um, well informed and motivated faculty if you train them will handle education technology related issues far better faculty will introduce need based innovations and changes in higher education if you empower them and encourage them colleges should conduct uh, education research as an area as we conduct domain specific research publish such data uh, in the uh, peer reviewed journals for decision makers to review and initiate necessary changes based on the facts and evidences that's what i'm going to um, share with you education given will be then closer to the market needs 
skill and attitude development of students will be better because our faculty is upskilled continuously. Because unless the faculty are competent, you cannot bring competent graduates. I think the, 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 the issue is very clear and we have to realize this. Unless we have good faculty, we cannot give good education. So therefore, we must do everything necessary to empower our faculties. Okay, uh, I, I just want to make a mention that to me, education is also a practice after putting in about 40 years in um, uh, teaching, training, research and uh, um, administration. To me, education is also practice. Many people think that practice means pharmacy practice for our practice means medical practice no every teacher is a practitioner we have been practicing for years and decades i practiced for 40 years okay um, we practice training we, we take lectures we do research we uh, design the curriculum we, we are practicing day in and day out i want you to just have this message so i put here medical practice and uh, teaching as a practice doctor talk to the patients in practice we talk to the people in our teaching practice the patients have problems here our students are having problems he the doctor checks and prescribes medicine we prescribe them new skills new knowledges new attitudes new communications new um, uh, industrial skills etc etc doctors use tools and techniques to check the patients we have our tools and techniques for assessment whether it is formative assessment or summative assessment doctors are trained in hospitals our teachers are to be trained in the institution so therefore, there is not much of a difference. I want to just share you that. Now, after having said that the skill development is needed, what are the areas of skill development, which I will come back again, share with you some topics. Now I want to come to you what is called as education research or academic research uh, quickly. Uh, this research, education research, what we call has nothing to do with domain specific research, please. We are not talking about statistics research, chemistry research, practice research, clinical pharmacy research here. We are talking research in academics. Education research is doing research in education and all related aspects of teaching, learning, training, laboratory skills, assessments, academic advising, scholarly activities, to name a few areas. And academic research topics are well designed, conducted and published in scientific journals like one of the journal I can quote is AJPE, American Journal of Pharmaceutical Education. If you open and see, which I have been reading for more than 30 years, uh, there are so many good articles about education research there. But however, in India, this area has not caught up. And I hope in the, uh, I'm going around and sensitizing in this area, we need to do research in education, research in education, um, find out the facts, find out the evidences, find out the areas that we have to change systematically and bring in those changes uh, systematically and very frequently. Um, where I was working for 11 years in UAE, we used to change the uh, curriculum every year because we are a unitary university. I know it's not so easy in Indian environment, but still deemed universities, autonomous colleges who are supposed to have their own curriculum and uh, do better than the others in academics, they, are, they, they should be empowered and encouraged at least to start with. And those who are very old colleges, 50 year old, 70 year old, because we are already a 90 year old organization. We are heading for uh, um, uh, centenary uh, very soon in 1928. So research in education to some of you may look like a brand new area. It's doing research systematically in all aspects of education like curriculum, assessment, training, practice school, project work, program outcome, course outcome. There is a project work. How are we doing on that project work? What are the problems? Can we do it as a research work and come out properly? What are the lacunas? How to fill them? with evidences, taking the feedback from the students, taking the feedback from the faculty who are doing it, taking the feedback from the end users, maybe industry, how do we change and change that systematically in the uh, regulatory framework. So research in curriculum design, research in the ongoing program, research in uh, and innovation in assessments, maybe formative or summative. I've tried to list here a few topics for education research, which are conducted, um, uh, you know, elsewhere. Uh, and uh, we need to think on this. How to write effective course learning outcomes with um, Bloom's taxonomy hierarchy, an attempt to raise the quality of teaching and learning. When I talk to people here, people are aware of Bloom's taxonomy, some of them. People are aware of uh, learning outcomes and program outcomes. If I ask them, are you writing? Have you vetted them? Uh, have you uh, discussed with them? Uh, have you modified them over a period of years? Then there are a lot of um, um, uh, issues and uh, eyebrow raising. We need to uh, strengthen these. 
And many people are not aware of Bloom's taxonomy. They have not heard the word. And we need to train them with Bloom's taxonomy because that is the fundamental basis for uh, designing the curriculum. Because Bloom, way back in uh, uh, late 1950s, uh, said that uh, learning happens in a hierarchical way. In education, there are six tires. In skills, there are tires. And in competency or attitude, there are tires of learning. In, uh, For example, in um, uh, uh, education, um, um, the, the the knowledge knowledge domain, uh, the hierarchies are, you know, remembering and learning, understanding and learning, uh, applying and learning, critical thinking and learning, formulative thinking and learning, problem solving and learning. We are normally stuck at the first two or three levels of rote learning, understanding learning, application learning to some extent, but we are not taking and raising the bar of learning into critical thinking and learning, problem solving and learning, and uh, original thinking and creative learning like that. And there is a need to do that. That's why we can do research on that. Can we add in the timetable hours or hours for active learning, like library session? SDL is self-directed learning, team-based learning, academic advising, and reduce the load or load of rote learning courses. Uh, these are the some key reflections. Can we do a research on this? this? Is the topic? Can we introduce problem-based learning or team-based learning in the curriculum? Some thoughts and experiments. I know some people are saying that. Uh, they are talking on problem-based learning and uh, I'm not very sure somebody is using team-based learning. Some people have told me that we are using team-based learning. If you're doing that, how are you doing? Why don't you publish a paper on that with the proper data, with the proper data and with the proper feedback from the students, how you do it, what is the procedure? How do you, how you go about writing the problem? How do you vet that problem? How do you write learning outcomes for that problem? How do you train to, the students to learn the problem-based learning systematically? Do you do, do two sessions of uh, two hours per week? Do you do three sessions of three hours per week? Or do you do two sessions of three hours a week? All this needs to be documented and published as a paper so that others can learn. That is the whole idea of this research. Some novel and innovative tools and techniques for formative and summative assessment. See, we are stuck with very rigid and age old uh, uh, tools of uh, sessionals and uh, uh, just writing and assessing. No, the world has changed. There are a lot of uh, new assessment uh, tools in uh, formative assessment, like uh, you have a quiz, you have an assignment, you may have a team based learning, you may have a small project work, you may have a seminar presentation. There are varieties of things. And um, um, I think the COVID is going to force you that you have to change the tools of assessment. Now, people are already talking about online assessment instead of the on-site assessment. Like that, we have to change the tools because just rote learning only checks the, whether the student remembers or not. Why not to, you check him through a quiz and give him a small assignment, let him do a project, and um, we can see the, um, uh, how the students are uh, uh, doing them differently. You know, computer-based assessment, can it reduce the manual and repetitive work of faculty save time and still be effective and useful? Sometimes when I go around, I see, you know, people are, faculties are still wedded to their attendance registers, uh, marking uh, uh, absent and present and uh, writing, uh, entering the marks manually into the register here and there. A lot of manual work goes on. No, it's the age of computers. Computers can save your time. Computers can, you can put it, some of you, I know you are all uh, using them and doing them. I'm giving this message to those uh, who are not using these uh, tools, um, the, the, the digital tools, use them. So there can be, a, if somebody is doing, you can share that as a research work properly. Okay, how to do that, I will share with you. Digitization of formative and some assessment, a prospective thought. How to minimize students copying in the examination? See, the copying has become a big problem. How can you reduce this? Can you think about it? What are the um, copying trends that the student, what are the solutions to them? Can we implement them? And can we share that as a project work and a research paper so that others can learn from it? Because this is a menace everywhere, not only in India, even the top institutes like maybe Harvard or MIT, whatever you call, they also have, especially with the use of these gadgets, the Wi-Fi, the, the 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 internet the mobile um, uh, the it, this um, uh, copying has become a big problem to everybody so we need to find new out of the box solutions to these emerging 21st century problems in the uh, classroom and in the laboratory in the form of copying uh, what are the advantages of autonomous colleges are deemed to be invested to make teaching and learning more effective and useful we have already autonomous colleges and deemed universities some of them are as well already 10 years old can they share their experience, what they have done in the last 10 years? 
how they have changed the curriculum how they have changed the assessment how they have changed the uh, um, you know um, uh, the, the the teaching learning how they have changed their credit systems how they have improved the programs so that it becomes a uh, learning uh, exercise and uh, um, uh, inspiring exercise for others regulatory changes needed to raise the quality and standards of pharmacy education some thoughts for implementation so if somebody is thinking that uh, all this is possible if you do research in education bring about good papers give it to the regulators and uh, decision makers publish them they give a wider uh, um, public domain uh, seeing so that you know people can look at it and if it is evidence based if it is research based if it is fact based people have to accept that and especially if it is done in multi centric places multiple authors different states different territories different regions then that becomes a very very important useful information for uh, decision makers in the universities or uh, regulating bodies like pci to bring in the uh, necessary change and the matter should be pushed uh, properly so like that you know i have tried to list here um, the topics are uh, endless you, you can do in um, research in institutional research and ethics committees and uh, uh, the advantage with this research is you know it costs nothing except paper time and energy and your brain power you do not need special equipments here you don't need instruments you don't need consumables you don't need lakhs of rupees to be sanctioned from somewhere um, if you have some money of course it can be used for uh, creating uh, some basic infrastructure of the digital tools uh, some stationery and um, if possible some uh, incentive for uh, uh, the principal investigator and uh, other uh, co-investigators for the project so but the research project that you design in education research must have a very clear title it should have a very clear hypothesis it should be objective should be measurable and specific clear methodology has to be written research and discussion has to be brought out afterwards and there should be good conclusion etc in a regular research work as you do you have to do in education research and the project that you conceive must be approved by the institutional research and ethics committee or the board that you call so that you know there is a collaborative decision making and you take feedback from the right uh, authorities and do it properly uh, other features that you know this research education research i'm talking can be multi-centric there can be multiple authors so that we can test the repeatability reproducibility and dependability of research as we are doing research one research on a, a pharmaceutics may be done in karnataka in one college the same thing may be done in a csir laboratory in the north or it may be done in the west in another college so multi-centric studies even now covid we are trying to find out a solution they are being done globally and in india itself there are several companies which are working on um, research and uh, trying to come out so it's not that only somebody one should person should do it multiple people can always do it so that the result becomes more reliable dependable and things like that it is good colleges if regulators um, accreditators fund such projects to some extent a small amount maybe 5000 10000 rupees 25000 rupees if they give you this is the problem can you look at scientifically do a survey do a research project this is an experiential research get some proper feedback from the students uh, and uh, the end users get to the feedback from the faculties with proper questionnaire uh, which is vetted which is tested uh, then it becomes very useful it will also infuse spirit of competition amongst the faculty to find evidences and facts can be divided this research project can be divided as a major project and a minor research project and funding can flow uh, depending on the objectives they write depending on the time and the effort that has been spent by the, uh, the researchers okay different methods to improve teacher quality let's look at this one is to replace the existing teaching with better ones the the the, the, the approach to the, the air traffic controllers in the 1980s fire them all and start again with better ones won't work, there aren't any better teachers out there, sorry, or improve the effectiveness of existing teachers. And that sounds like a good idea, except that it's quite hard to do because we don't know what makes uh, that Is it going well? We can make a difference from the research I quoted earlier, but we don't know what makes the difference in teachers. We know it's not advanced content matter knowledge. Okay, the second video is on now. Is it uh, uh, It's going slow, is it? I mean, 
does making sure that every elementary school teacher it's good sir it's a little bit slow but it's good of third grade math that's not very simple okay okay what's more surprising oh, okay, okay. is that pedagogical content knowledge is important for third grade okay, math then. teachers it's okay. to know about yeah we cannot to know i cannot third help you math math okay, okay really deep right right you would assume it would and in fact if you are taught by a more knowledgeable teacher you will learn more but not that much more if you were taught by a teacher with above average knowledge of what university of michigan call mathematical knowledge for teaching if you're taught by a more knowledgeable teacher you will learn more about an extra two weeks more per year that's more learning but not much and if you have a master's degree in education or a qualification for the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards, the evidence so far is maybe an extra 5% of student progress. So the difficult thing is that we know that teachers make a difference, but we can only account for about 20 to 25% of it. In a brilliant article in the New Yorker, Malcolm Gladwell compared this to finding quarterbacks for the NFL, a very timely feature since we're in since we are just currently in the drafting process for the NFL. Um, and apparently, how well these guys played in college predicts very well how well they'll play in the pros at every position except quarterback. I think it's due to the fact that the, most colleges use the spread offense and it just can't use that in, in the pros because those, those defensive backs are just too big and too fast. If there's any gaps there, they'll get through it. So there's a search for how to work out on the basis of their college performance, which quarterbacks are going to be any good in the NFL. And their big idea, IQ testing. Seriously, every quarterback who's in the draft has to take the Wonderlick test. And it's extraordinary. Some of the, it has no predictive power at all. Bottom scorers on the Wonderlick include Terry Bradshaw, Dan Marino, and some of the best quarterbacks of all time. And those who come up with these great scores, these people, they got the brilliant ability to read the field, yes, but they're not very good at quarterbacks. And in fact, one of the problems that you have, you can get, you can get selected for a teacher training program without ever anybody finding out whether you actually like children very much. As you heard, I used to be assistant principal at King's College London, and we have the largest medical school in Europe. And we used to pay about 400 doctors every year. And we had a program of three-year preclinical, year four, out into clinical practice. And we'd find these students coming back and saying, I don't think I want to be a doctor. I said, why not? Well, it involves spending a lot of time with sick people. <laughs> yes, did you not think that might be... <laughs> Kind of core feature of the job somehow why do you choose well I, I wanted to get into medicine because it was tough to get into so we started actually putting clinical experience in year one so that they could actually discover whether you do you really want to spend the next 40 years of your life being with sick people and in the same way i think we ought to find out whether people who actually want to be teachers really like children very much So we don't know what makes these people good. But let's say we could raise the bar for entry into teaching, as recommended by some of these hardline economists. The problem is, if we raise the bar so that you had to have higher skills or whatever to get into teaching, for 30 years, there's still going to be teachers teaching who got in under the bar. <clears throat> the effect is going to take 30 years to materialize. And my, my estimate is that you get one extra student passing a test per class in 30 years. the US. So we have to help you do a better job in your own classrooms. What I call the one you're with strategy. Now, I've taken half an hour to get to this point. Professional development is a good idea.
But I hope that you think the time has been well spent because here's what I've been really arguing is this. Professional development is not a nice thing for, to have for teachers to keep up to date with new ideas. There hasn't been anything new in teaching for at least 2,000 years, as far as I'm concerned. The reason you need professional development is because every single one of you experience failure on a daily basis. You show me a teacher who's not failing on a daily basis, and I will show you a teacher with very low expectations of her students. Our daily experience is failure. We teach these wonderful lessons, we take in the kids' notebooks, we look at what they wrote, and we wonder what planet they were on when we were teaching. Them. And that's the great thing about teaching. You never get any good at it. Teachers, no amount of success is enough. My kids used to say to me, sir, you're never satisfied. Precisely. No amount of success is enough. And ultimately, it becomes a mental health issue for teachers. You better pray that you believe that you're failing on a daily basis. Because if you don't believe you're failing, you're not paying attention. But more importantly, it becomes a mental health issue for you. Because if you don't think you can do a better job tomorrow than you did today, then you'll end up blaming the kids. What can you expect from these kids? Words that, when spoken by a professional, ought, in my view, to lead to instant dismissal. Because anybody with that, with that attitude isn't getting as much out of their kids as somebody, like I hope most of you in this room, who has unreasonable optimism about what you can actually achieve with your kids. And we are so optimistic. We want every kid to get this stuff. We really believe I mean, we're, we're wrong all the time, but we are hopelessly optimistic. And it's what makes teaching the best job in the world because you never get any good at it. At one time, Andre Previn was the highest paid film score composer in Hollywood. And one day he walked into his office and he quit. And somebody said, to him, why do you quit this amazing job? He said, I wasn't scared anymore. Every day he was going to his office and he was doing his job, his job held no more challenges for him. This is something you are never going to have to worry about. This job is so difficult that one lifetime is not enough to master it. So you need to carry on getting better as a teacher until you retire or die. That's the deal. And that's why this veto is so important. Because I hope you agree that you need to improve, not because you're not good enough, but because you can be even better. But the important point is then, what do you work on getting better at? And that's what's very hard, because this kind of pointed out that if you've got a taxation system, you really make sure you're spending the money you've got properly before you raise any more taxes. So his idea was that a Pareto improvement is, an improve, is a change in the way you're doing things that can make at least one person better off without making anybody else worse off. So the question is, are your schools Pareto optimal? Are there other things you can do to make your schools better without more money? I mean, anybody can improve things by throwing money at the problem. Can you make your schools better without spending money? Okay, friends. Uh, what do we get the message from the last video? I, I understand that uh, the video is uh, not coming well. There is a small... Um, a uh, time gap of uh, five or 10 seconds between uh, what is being said there and uh, the lip movements. I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know how to fix this problem. This is a technical problem, a technological problem. Anyway, uh, that's why I have made a PowerPoint. What was the message from that video? The message is very clear to improve the quality of teachers and teaching. One method is replace the existing teachers with the better ones or the best ones. But that is a very impossible and formidable task to do because there are no good teachers anymore, anywhere. As I told you already, there is a shortage of teachers. So replacing the existing teachers is not a solution to improve the quality of teachers and the quality of teaching. So next, what we need to do is improve the effectiveness of existing teachers as better teachers are not just available and ready outside. So it is 
uh, very hard to train teachers as we don't know what really makes good teaching. That's what was said. We really don't know what is good teaching. Good teaching is delivering good lectures, good laboratories, good assessment, good communication skill. There are varieties of things which go in what when you say a good teacher, uh, there are 101 things which go into that. So that we need to figure out and uh, note running program will tell you how to like you or love your students and that is extremely important. So if you are in a teaching profession, you must love the students with whom you are going to work. You love, you love the profession which you are teaching, which you belong. You have to love your colleagues and you have to love your job. So that is no training programs will um, uh, fascinatedly tell you. So this is what is the, um, uh, you know, is a challenge in the teaching. That's what the gentleman in the um, video said that love the ones you are with strategy is the best strategy even in teaching. And he said that teachers fail on a daily basis and for good teachers, no amount of success is enough. There is no success is not a uh, is an end. It's a beginning for a new challenge for um, for good teachers. So good teachers cannot just stay back and uh, lie back on their laurels. No, they have to look for new avenues of improving. Teaching is so difficult that one lifetime is not enough to master it. That's what the very learned and experienced speaker in the video said. Carry on getting better every day. He said, until you retire or until you die. That's the deal in teaching. Are you ready for that deal? Think about that. Can you do better in the college without spending too much money? That is also a challenge. If you can do that, it's wonderful. You will be happy. Your students are happy. Your colleagues are happy. Your managements are happy because you are bringing in a change without much spending there. Can you make at least 1% better off without making anyone else worse off? That's what he said. It's also good teaching and good contribution. Okay, there are other, many areas of education research I have listed here. You can do education research in programs, study plans, credits, in curriculum, courses, laboratories, innumerable areas. You can do in uh, your uh, practical training or you call experiential learning, industrial training, hospital training, community training, clinical training, varieties of training. What are the challenges we have? How do we improve the quality of the training given to students in the industry, in the hospital or in the community pharmacy? I think these are big gaps, um, if you agree with me, in our present um, um, curriculum system. And uh, you can do, as I said earlier, in formative and summative and grading system itself. Education, regulation itself, standards and requirements, um, the, the needs to be changed. As I know, with my experience internationally, uh, very few universities and the regulating bodies give the curriculum. They just give you what is the minimum input and what is the output qualification needed. What is minimum entry level qualification to get into pharmacy? Maybe 60% or 70% in PCB or PCMB and a TOEFL score of 500 is the entry point. There cannot be any dilution on this. And the entry at the exit, after the entry, the exit, minimum you have to score 50% or 60% or 70% in internationally to clear a course. And then they will just leave it to you to design the curriculum and they will give broad learning outcomes for a program and for the courses. And it's for you to design innovatively what is needed. And so standards are built like that internationally. They do not give a curriculum and then, you know, create problems there, uh, 100 corrections, 200 corrections. It's left to the imagination of the uh, faculties in the colleges and the universities, especially deemed universities, autonomous colleges can easily do this if they are empowered and they are encouraged. Yeah, more uh, research areas you can do. Problem associated with the use of technology in education. What are the problems? How to address them? How technology development is imparting edu in higher education? How it is helping us? Models to inculcate soft skills in the faculty or the students. What models are you using? Because soft skill is important. Attitude is important. How do you inculcate them? Has anybody done any research on this? No, it's not. But internationally, yes, there are papers. I'm aware of that. So these topics are only suggest you, it's your imagination now. You can design, get it approved in your colleges, start doing research and start publishing this area also because it doesn't cost money. But it will definitely change the mindset of the decision makers, the, um, uh, the, the senior academician, leaders in uh, um, uh, educational institutions, regulators, whether University Pharmacy Council of India, they will think because you are bringing a lot of evidences and experience and facts before to take the decision and especially if it done multi-centrically in varieties of places collaboratively by the faculties it will have a lot of impact more research areas i have listed here 
um, on teaching and learning difference in teaching strategies of renowned universities we can see how they are doing and how we are doing can we do a comparison <coughs> and publication of research work in peer reviewed journals is very very important then only it will the information will be disseminated and there will be wider readership wider scholarly activities more people will start thinking on that and uh, it's extremely important hope you will take this uh, suggestion of mine um, seriously and reflect on this and think about it and see what changes you think are relevant not necessarily what i have said i'm giving you some thoughts based on my 40 years of teaching and uh, research experience okay now i want to share with you a research article which i recently published with my friend in the united states uh, this is an education research article this just came last week in um, uh, indian journal of pharmaceutical education and research this is a two-year work, one year of actual um, work in an institution, and its publication took almost about um, uh, six to eight months. And this paper was published, um, presented in the National Pharmaceutical Federation Conference in Abu Dhabi, uh, United Arab Emirates, in September 2009. Uh, and this was published in the ISEPAR, uh, April, June 2020 issue. The page numbers are here. I can share this and you can go and search in the latest issue of the ISEPAR. This paper is sitting there. Upskilling of pharmacy faculty in an accredited institution through modular training in strategic education practices with formative and summative assessment. This means we do training from HISDAR. We don't roll out certificates just like that. You attend one hour, two hour. No, you have to undergo modular training program and there will be a formative and summative assessment. There will be pre-tests before the modules and the post-test after the modules. I will share with you as I go along. The summary of this uh, presentation is that a modular training was designed and delivered for in um, an institution in India with a minimum of 60 face-to-face -face contact hours, 60 contact hours. This was a four credit hour course with formative as well as summative assessment. A minimum of 15 modules were presented in a workshop format with four hour for each module, uh, which guided uh, activities, reflective time, discussions, presentation, pre-test and post-test, and the feedback. 27 of the 32 enrolled completed the training program and were awarded participation and merit certificates. Five of them uh, also they did not get because they could not complete certain aspect of the formative test they did not do well enough the part they had to repeat that uh, th that's why they could not take participant wanted more such programs especially the young faculty so that they are well informed motivated and transformed to meet the challenges of modern higher education in par with the international standards and 21st um, uh, century learning this is the pictorial uh, abstract of um, the paper that has been published there where we enroll the participants in the uh, we enroll the participants in 60 hour uh, um, on-site training uh, of 15 modules and uh, these topics were decided based on their needs there was a pre-workshop -work activity there was an on-site workshop activity there was a post-workshop activity and uh, uh, we did a continuous and the end module assessment grading and certification knowledge skill and attitude of the participants enhanced uh, uh, enormously and we saw that uh, the average pre-test score in all the training modules was only 4.2 on 10. We see that only 42 percent was the average score of the faculties and sometimes it went even below to 3.8 on 10. Whereas after the modules and the training was given, the, the score of post-test went as high as 9.6, 9.4, like that, indicating that uh, the training had clearly impacted on their knowledge, skill, and attitude of the faculty who participated. And of course, they had to pay a nominal fee for running this training program on the site and uh, they uh, made the, this training program compulsory for the uh, all the faculties to attend in the college now i see a very very big formidable task which i cannot do individually we need to work collectively and bring about the change in the whole country because we are talking about i talked about one college where we did some work but we are talking about 2000 colleges in the country and many more maybe um, uh, on the anvil how do we change how do we train these faculties this has to be a, a national uh, program it must be conceived in a very very big way it should be delivered in a big way and we should change the mindset of our teachers and upskill them and reskill them this is what um, is the conclusion from the paper now i will quickly tell you uh, since january 2009 2019 for the last one and a half year hesdar is running a, a free 
weekly training modules on all Thursdays from 4 o'clock to 4.45 and uh, some it continues uh, for another half an hour, one hour question and answer session and it is repeated at 7.30. I have completed 68 modules, 68 weeks so far uh, as on date, that is today 1st of uh, June, uh, completed so far various topics. Hosting on um, hosting on the webinar portal work is underway. We are trying to put all these modules and going to put it on a webinar for pay, format and asynchronous learning. They can learn from anywhere uh, after paying a nominal um, fee for assessment, etc. The work is going on. In another one or two months, we would like to put it in place. It will include pre-test and post-test after each topic containing the modules. We do not give any certificate just for participation. Um, uh, you you get a lot of certificate these days, just you go and attend, you get certificate. Hesdar never gives up a certificate like that. Uh, there must be a pre-test when you enroll into the training program and there will be a post-test. Gradually, we will see how you are changing and only when you meet a minimum criteria of um, passing the particular module and a particular course, then only you will get the um, certificate. Otherwise, you have to repeat some of the um, um, assessment modules, maybe formative modules or the um, end module, uh, end assessment modules. Yeah, these are the on-site or online um, uh, training modules for the faculty on pedagogy, online teaching. It, you can read it for online as well as on-site. Learner engagement dealing with difficult students, education, technology and tools, ethics and decision making in education, effective communication in education, attitude, soft skills like time and uh, self-management in hybrid learning, ICT in online classroom and outside, uh, course learning outcomes, specific and individuals, taking the feedback from the faculties, systematic assessment of learning and feedback using uh, Kirkpatrick uh, model of uh, taking feedback, uh, examination of learning continuously and end course by MCQ and other techniques, innovations in assessment and examination tools for online and hybrid learning. This is very important now. You have to change your assessment. You have to go for online learning. So how are you designing the online learning tools? How are you checking them? How are you seeing that it's very rugged? etc etc academic advising for online learners is going to be a very very challenging area now uh, we are training in that if a student is in the campus you can guide them you can mentor them when he is not there three fourth of the time in a year how are you going to guide him this is a challenging and it can be done it should be done continuous guidance and hand holding for online teacher and learner uh, and we design specific modules based on the faculty needs and the college and the university needs yeah uh, we do not uh, give um, uh, um, back to college after lockdown. This gentleman is carrying webinar certificates in a huge bag. Um, I heard, in fact, while talking to one of the faculty in a college, uh, he had accumulated more than uh, uh, 80 or 100 certificates. Every day attending one or two webinars. That doesn't mean anything to me particularly because we do not know what has been learned after attending the program and what change the person is going to do in the day to day work after the whole thing is um, the lockdown is opened up and the colleges start working. What is the change you are going to bring in in your own course, in your college? That's more important to me than accumulating the certificates. So we have a small uh, video now of the uh, Hesdar Center, then I, I, we, will, we are coming to the end in another uh, 10 minutes. Hello everyone, Hesdar Center which started its journey in uh, September 2017 has contributed a lot in the last uh, two and a half years to pharmacy education in particular, especially in uh, reskilling and uh, upskilling the faculty uh, in uh, uh, especially the younger faculty, training them in micro teaching and how to engage the students effectively. Uh, middle order faculty, how to design a good uh, program and uh, course learning outcomes. And senior faculty in benchmarking and uh, international standards in higher education, designing of new curriculum, things like that. Uh, Hesdar Center, the basic belief is that if there are good faculties in the colleges, they will bring about enormous changes in teaching and learning. We have international, national and regional advisory boards of eminent personalities to advise us uh, regarding our future course of action. I, I thank personally each and uh, every one of you who are associated with Hesdar in some way or the other. Thank you. <laughs>
name is Dr. Deborah Parker. I'm Dean for the College of Pharmacy at the University of Findlay in Ohio, United States. I'm pleased to share with you that Dr. Nagavi has visited our institution several times over the past several years, and we have a very positive relationship with him. I'm impressed with his credentials, and in particular by the fact that he founded the HESDAR Center in order to improve the quality of the educational experience provided by Indian professors, specifically in the field of pharmacy. We are pleased to collaborate with him and believe that our relationship improves our faculty and his faculty's ability to deliver high quality education and that it improves the experience of all of our students. We wish him continued success and are happy to continue to collaborate. Hello, my name is Dr. Sandra Earle and I am one of the associate deans here at the University of Findlay College of Pharmacy. I am uh, the associate dean in charge of assessment here at the College of Pharmacy. And so I work hard to make sure that we're improving all the time and measuring what we're doing so we can improve. I have had the distinct pleasure to meet with Dr. Nagavi twice, uh, not once but twice, and we have wonderful discussions about the tools that we use here at the university to ensure that our students are learning what we've set out for them to learn and other we debate topics about assessment and learn from each other. It's been a wonderful collaboration and I know that he is working hard to help other colleges of pharmacy uh, ensure that they have wonderful assessment tools and are um, producing strong pharmacists. Damon Osborne, and I'm the Associate Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the University of Finley. In that role, I largely oversee our online learning enterprise, many different aspects of the operations of how we do online learning here, including the teaching and learning aspects, as well as technology. And in that regard, I met Dr. Nagavi and was very excited about the opportunity that he presented to us in working with Indian uh, pharmacists and pharmacy students to further their knowledge. Using an online platform, I wish him nothing but the best of success.
a pharmacist playing the role in clinical care and there are students who are looking at clinical care. Of course, there are challenges also. People telling there are no jobs. Where do we go after this, all these clinical studies? Uh, where do we find a job? What role can I play? So these questions also are coming back to us and uh, uh, the jobs or the roles are not created by any people or it has to be created by uh, one's own uh, private initiative. experience of healthcare center with my students and the faculty. As you can see, the, your presentation was very well received by the students and they were quite amazed and surprised by the number of pharmacy degrees offered in India and what type of pharmacy skills the person needs to practice as a pharmacist. Hi, my name is Kalpesh Mata. I am a senior consultant at Hesgar Center, Mysore. I have been involved with the Delta Center since its inception in September 2017. Firstly, I am very thankful for all the treatment that we have received during this last two and a half years where we worked with a couple of colleges and universities trying to uh, intervene in the uh, teaching learning process and improve and see how we can add value and improve them. So at SDAR Center, the last two and a half years, uh, what, uh, what is my learning or what we have learned is that teacher is the single most influencing factor or the effectiveness of teacher uh, teaching is the single most influencing factor for a student outcome. So in process to achieve an effective uh, teaching mechanism, it's very much important that we transform the current uh, teaching methodologies and also enable our teachers with the latest in the technology so that they can create engaging classrooms. So if the, if the student is engaged in the classroom, the outcome, the learning what a student gets in the classroom is phenomenal. So for this, uh, at HESDA, we have been working to create a framework uh, which engages the students, empowers the teacher by leveraging a lot of uh, technology and also teaching them how to implement problem-based learning, team-based learning, uh, uh, and create effective course outcomes. I think I have come back to the learning outcomes that I had listed uh, before the, at the session uh, commencement. 
uh, I think I have tried to identify in this presentation um, some of the gaps generally that exist in higher education and what we need to do. And I identified specific gaps with respect to the faculty and how we should upskill and reskill them. I, I, I listed a few advantages of the skill development of faculty. I try to define and explain what do we mean by education research. And I listed a few areas of um, academic research or education research you can conduct and which are very um, badly needed uh, today. And uh, I shared with you one of our um, education research article published uh, after enormous uh, of one year work uh, in the Indian Journal of Pharmacy Education and Research, which had just appeared a week back and tried to describe to you the focused activities of the HESDA Center. Thank you very much for your uh, time. Um, uh, I stopped this with uh, this quote from Elon Musk. Elon Musk uh, uh, is the person who is responsible for, uh, came from a very humble beginning, had a lot of tough time, and today uh, uh, he is an icon for success as an individual. You know, he is responsible for, for PayPal, responsible for electric cars in the United States called Tesla, and he's started a company called SpaceX. Just yesterday, um, they launched, uh, along with NASA, a spacecraft into the air, you might have uh, into the space, you might have seen that in the future, Elon Musk wants to take people, like you go for international travel, you can go um, inter-space uh, uh, travel in the future, that's what his dream. Um, so he says that, I think it's possible for ordinary people to choose to be extraordinary. Whether you want to be ordinary teacher or you want to be an extraordinary teacher depends on you. You and you and you. And other people can support you, give you facilities, it will help you. But unless you decide that you want to be an excellent teacher, good teacher, role model teacher, nobody else can do that for you. So with that small hope and um, our collective experience uh, and wisdom can help us uh, find uh, answers to the existing problems and as well as the future problems. So thank you very much. Stay home, stay uh, safe. Uh, thank you for your uh, participation. Uh, great day. Bye bye. I send give it back to the organizers. Thank you, organizers. By the story, you motivated the teachers to inspire and transform students. You told about the practice of teaching very well. The solutions were very well addressed to cover the gap, sir. Okay. Thank you. And experiments to interest. To introduce the problem-based learning in curriculum, it is very well expressed. Good teachers should not stay back with their laurels. That was very inspiring and motivating, sir. You have proved that training the faculty can make a best teacher, sir. Surely participate in the training program by his dad, sir, uh, to upgrade ourselves. Thank you for that uh, help. And final decision is asked, is a good uh, conclusion, sir. Very nice, uh, nicely concluded. And sir, here are uh, there are many questions. Already you have answered uh, through your presentation through those questions for those questions. But very few I want to uh, uh, present you, sir. Uh, sure. uh, Doctor uh, J N Suresh, sir, Principal Nursar of Pet uh, Institute of Pharmaceutical Science, Andhra Pradesh. He has uh, posted, sir. Does has done provide any such training to students in respect of practice school for B pharmacy. I repeat, sir. Does <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. provide any such training to students in respect of practice school for B pharmacy? Uh, yeah, I would say that, yeah, a very clear answer. Has dark do not provide Hello. per se any training, any kind of training to the students. <laughs> Whether he is a diploma student or a B pharma student, we do not provide any training through HESDAR. However, we have just made a beginning here for diploma students because I am based in Mysore. Some interested students of B farm in community pharmacy, we are just giving them the training. Outside, we do not give, but I have the modules. If somebody is keen, we can train them and they can implement within the existing system. But we do not take students, we don't enroll them, we don't collect fees, and we do, don't run that. But we do only for teachers. Sir, next question is, what are the evaluation methods? Are they to screen the students' ability during and after pandemic? What are the evaluation methods? Are they to screen the students' ability during and after COVID-19 pandemic, sir? Yeah, yeah. See, the normal evaluation tools that we are using 
is sessionals and end semester exam which are only based on question answer writing am i right you take in a semester in every course maybe two tests or three tests or more of them and you take the average of two or three that's all over and that is a test which you take in the classroom now the covid has challenged you that you can't meet face to face so frequently in the college for teaching forget about testing okay so therefore you have to change the teaching methodology i mean the assessment methodology and you can shift over to online testing that is possible we are already doing it for our teacher training programs where you can conduct a quiz you can give an assignment and collect it back comment and send it back you can use flipgrid and other uh, tools where you can check their communication skill and give back you can take feedback everything is done and possible in a green way without um, not touching any paper anywhere it's possible and it can also be done in the uh, for any course in a education system you can there are a lot of platforms available uh, in the public domain like uh, we are using google classroom there are other platforms which are available using them you can design a, a mcq test or an rre test for an online examination during covid or after covid what you want to do if the college decides to do that there are ways and out and we are already doing for in the teachers training program when we are doing online thank you sir one more question is there what are the effective educational models of learning for weekend college i repeat sir what are the effective educational models of learning for weekend college <laughs> I, I i don't get the correct question here what is the education actually model? i think uh, this Uh, this faculty has asked that uh, after the weekend that means in the weekend when there is no college when we don't have college so during those days what are the effective models we can do educational models we can learn see education model in the weekend you have to do distance learning e learning hybrid learning if you want to call that h learning with that we are calling because you have already held them for four or five days in the college at the weekend you can create an asynchronous model of learning you can put your um, learning material uh, in the google classroom or your own classroom for the student to read you can put your powerpoint material in the um, classroom your own google classroom which people are doing for the faculty students to see if they have missed anything if they want to repeat you can have a discussion room a chat room there for weekend where students can post questions you answer them or they learn from others and you watch them and give them appropriate feedback you can conduct tests to see how they are learning during the week what is the challenges of the learner how to help the learner learn better how to motivate the learner how to assist the learner how to facilitate learning all that thing can be done in the weekend you can teach you can test you can facilitate learning you can do whole lot lot of things are possible thank you sir one more question how to change the attitude and behavioral change of a student by teacher in a positive way very good well question i like this question okay because attitude testing is the most challenging testing in the education system we realize that education has four components one is knowledge upgradation skill upgradation attitudinal upgradation and upgradation of the communication skills these are the four pillars of education like four uh, legs of a chair and the most challenging here is how do we test the attitude of the student we did a project on this for one year when i was in um, uh, united arab emirates as a dean we identified five or four parameters of attitude and we measured them over a period of time from first semester to third semester or fourth semester continuously whatever i can recall i will tell you tell now offhand one of the attitude we in a student we can do it for the practice um, the faculty also was punctuality punctuality of the student in attending classes attending the assignment or the work that is given to the student that is an indicator of attitude time management skills and responding to um, challenges of meeting a deadline then their uh, interaction with the other students collaborative and cooperative skills then their communication skill in the classroom like when 
the person is in the class in the lab or during seminar presentation overall communication you can observe as a soft skill because uh, communication becomes a soft skill as well as a hard skill when you, when i am now talking to you i am displaying my communication as a non verbal and verbal communication using my voice using my hands similarly you can check the students it becomes a soft skill when we are talking about communicating properly communicating effectively communicating what is needed not talking unnecessarily not using appropriate words like this you can identify for you or six we had identified for you and like this um, uh, another we had identified i think was how a student is learning as a team team based learning of the student because students don't learn only from the uh, faculty they learn more from the students than the faculty so how is he good team learner is he a good listener how is his good behavior is he listening positive criticisms so like that we can identify certain uh, uh, measurable specific parameters of the soft skill put it on a likert scale and we used to ask the student to self evaluate themselves and the faculty will evaluate them and give, give a feedback the student may say sir my team um, um, uh, learning skill is um, 90% on 100 but the faculty will say no it is 90 on 100 it is only 70 on 100 uh, you need to improve your active learning skill you need to improve your presentation skill you need to put your effectively the, your thoughts and your words you have like that it can be done and i am i am very confident of i have we have done that it can be done it is manageable and approachable and it can be and it's very it is extremely important it is very very challenging area it is extremely important it should be done and it should be highlighted in the grade sheet we had gone for that but it is not going to we wanted it to be put in the mark sheet like you put how many marks the, the the student got for in the theory and the practical we wanted that even the soft skill his attitude should be put from first semester to eighth semester so that we can see the improvement in the attitude because you know there is a saying what is measured is improved what is measured is improved if you don't measure nothing is improved if you don't measure their knowledge they are not going to improve you are measuring their knowledge and telling you got only 40% he will struggle to improve it to 50% in the laboratory you are checking their skill and telling look you did a wrong measurement of the experiment they will improve communication you know no no you are not able to speak properly you are not confident they will improve if you don't measure soft skill it's not going to be improved that's why we have a problem we have to measure that skill we have to work out maze and make make it in a small way start and definitely um, uh, the experienced teachers can come around this as dar center can help in this definitely it is a workable and doable thing okay thank you sir there is one more question sir please what are the initiatives taken by ugc to impart training to freshers in teaching i repeat sir this is a question by dr nagaravi kiran what are the initiatives taken by ugc to impart training to freshers in teaching uh i can only i cannot speak on behalf of the ugc as you know i'm only an individual i can speak based on what i have read in the ugc guidelines and uh, what i have perceived and what i have speculated i can only tell that i know that ugc and aict have given what is the training needed for new teachers and the fresh teachers what are the areas in which they have to be trained they have listed education pedagogy assessment uh, you know time management some eight or 10 parameters are, are there i have gone through them but what is not given there is who will do it who will approve the doer how will you assess uh, the participant when he comes where are the pre tests and the post tests and who is conducting that program who is going to be assessed to do that program properly and who is going to pay for all this who is going to pay for all this have not been very clearly listed because somebody when they wanted to roll out that program uh, the teacher uh, uh, mentioning uh, i have read and i have seen that this program should be run free for teachers okay we must know that lunch is not free this i learned in 1994 when i went first time to united states lunch is not free nothing should be taken free and nothing should be given free there must be a value for it if you want to be very serious you have to pay a nominal amount of it who pays for it is a different whether the faculty should pay whether the partly faculty should pay college should pay other uh, uh, bodies should pay for it it's a different matter but there must be a payment for it then only there is a seriousness what is given for charity is just they say it's okay it's not taken seriously 
this is all i can tell about ugc ugc has a guideline but the methodology how to do who should do it who is going to accredit that program who is to give the certificates how the certificates have to be given how you enroll the uh, faculties nothing is given because you know faculties in hsdar training program we divide them into four or five categories because if you talk to a fresh faculty who is new two or three years experienced if there is a faculty who is 25 years experienced sitting there oh what is this going on here brick and mortar activity because it's very very uh, mundane to them but if i talk to the faculty who is 25 or 30 years old how to design a new curriculum how to do, write down course learning outcomes program learning outcomes what is benchmarking what is international standards in higher education if i talk about that which is applicable to the very senior faculty the new faculty sitting with two or three years experience he says it's all greek and latin so you have to give faculty training very focused to the need based group young faculty middle order faculty senior faculty administrative faculty different tiers of training and different modules of training based on their needs as to be done that's what has done does sir am i audible sir yeah you are audible i am hearing you yes, sir thank you sir thank you so much may all the participants they have said that it is a very insightful uh, inspiring and informative session sir and uh, uh, we are very very thankful to you for coming here for our today session and we all all the teachers we learn many things that we have to upgrade ourselves and we have to keep keep learning no uh, quitting of covid or with, i mean after covid or before covid whatever it is we'll be keep learning sir thank you for your inspirational talk sir very much and we are we are very we are very much privileged to be having you here sir thank you thank you so much thank sir. you very much here i close